Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. One of my favorite guests is Joel Skousen, probably one of the sharpest minds and best newsletters out there, analyzing the story between the lines. Uh, and one of the biggest stories going on lately is the story on Cyprus, the issues that uh, probably one of the only broad, uh, broadcasters and uh, guests that's talking about this and been writing for years is the issue that the Soviet Union never went away and our great enemies of Russia and China are tooling up with our facilitation by our globalist leaders in our country uh, to eventually uh, invade and take over America at some future date. The Red Dawn really is not just a movie set or a hypothesis, it's real. Uh, the Cyprus thing, let's, let's talk about all these top stories. And, your, of course, your newsletter comes out every week. They can get it through worldaffairsbrief.com, worldaffairsbrief.com. And, uh, Joel, thanks. I'm glad to hear that you're, you survived your recent crash. That's a little bit of a miracle. And I'm glad that you're as sharp as ever trying to give us the truth about what's going on because very few newsletter writers actually get through some of these stories. They often exaggerate issues or twist them the wrong way or don't understand the, the subtext of what's really going on behind the story behind the story. Well, that's right. Uh, there was a plethora of, uh, of pundits on the right saying, get your money out of the bank, that they're going to you know, tax your deposits just like in Cyprus. But that really isn't true. It's not that they wouldn't if they couldn't. Or, or, but uh, uh, the point is there was such a backlash from the taking of deposits in Cyprus that nobody dares pull that for quite a while yet. So I think, uh, you know, bank account things are very safe. In fact, it's almost impossible to run a business or your personal lives without, uh, you know, using the bank as less and less cash is, uh, is used. And it just becomes very, very difficult. Uh, but yeah, they shut down business. In other words, if they if they if they close down the banks, then business would literally seize up like a cardiac arrest. Is what you're saying? Well, that's right. You know, there have been all these false uh, prognostications or false claims. Of people in FEMA jackets talking, whispering around that there's going to be a bank holiday, and there isn't any reason at all to have a bank holiday. A bank holiday would freeze up the economy, and they'd get the blame for it. You know, they're not going to give us a chance to show that there is a conspiracy. They're not that stupid. And unfortunately, there's a tremendous amount of, of people around the net running around uh, yelling that the sky is falling. Now, I'm not saying that things are nice at all. I'm just saying that as an expert yeah, it, it, in how this conspiracy works and how the powers that be work, they have a lot more power to keep dragging this thing out. Yeah, it, it's years away is what years. you're saying. Many years and many steps before we reach that. Uh, this Cyprus thing, interestingly, and you cleared me up on this issue as well, there's three classes of, of individuals or groups that were affected by it. The first, of course, it's now evident, you told me this morning before the show, that the Russians had advanced knowledge that this is coming, so they pulled their money out. It's very probable that there are drug cartels, many of them, of course, approved in the approved, if you want to call it, laundering system for illegal drug money and arms shipment money. They probably got advanced notice, at least certain groups that were allied with the, with the West, uh, the people that got nailed were the people that were trying to evade taxes, uh, Americans and others around the world, and some of them didn't just get a 40% haircut. They lost 100% when those banks got dissolved. Uh, tell us the whole story. What's, what happened? Well, they dissolved the second largest bank, the Lycos Bank in Cyprus, and in the process of liquidating that, they said about uh, the depositors under 100,000 would be spared, uh, 100,000 euros, that's about 100,000. 30,000 U.S. dollars would be spared and that those accounts would be transferred to the Bank of Cyprus, which was saved. Uh, but the rest, above $100,000, they said we're going to take uh, a 40% haircut. That actually was a 40% average. It meant that they picked and choose, uh, chose winners. Some people and a lot of people lost everything, and some people got made whole. Uh, I found out this week uh, through some of the British sources that, in fact, the Russians, there's a third bank where a good portion of the Russian deposits were in for the Russian oligarchs and mafia, and they were allowed to clean out all of their deposits this past week, and so most of them were not caught in this. And, you know, that's typical of the strong-arming tactics that uh, you know, Moscow is, is capable of bringing to bear. Very few people in a small country like Cyprus want to uh, come up against the uh, uh, the Russian oligarchs or the Russian mafia. Right. In other words, uh, even if the uh, the other banks were ordering this, they would so that we wouldn't come down, the boot would not come down on their neck. The uh, powers that be in Cyprus would give the Russians advance notice, so they wouldn't end up becoming the brunt of it. 
Well, it isn't a matter of advance notice. It's just a matter of, of uh, how should I say, um, debating the closure of the bank. In other words, it was closed to everybody except a few. It wasn't a matter right. of advance notice. It was a matter of, uh, we'll let you in the back door. Oh, okay. In other words, we're going to open the wicket just for a select few. Okay. That's right. What happened is that this was a bailout of the private banks. This was not a bailout of Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus, well, let me put yeah. it this way. The banking economy in Cyprus is about eight times the size of the rather small tourist economy in Cyprus. Uh, you know, there is some agriculture, there is some uh, uh, trade, but money laundering and banking is the Cyprus economy. So there was no way in which they could gain sufficient collateral out of the country of Cyprus. They couldn't tax any more than what they are doing. That's why they went after the bank deposits. Their mistake, of course, was trying to shield the insiders and, and take, uh, you know, uh, 10% of everybody's bank account. It created a firestorm of protest. And frankly, I'm glad that they tried this. It, as I said before at the beginning, it makes it very unlikely they're going to pull this anytime soon just because it's, um, it's so unpopular. If they had to, you know, backtrack and make sure that everybody below 100,000 uh, euros was made whole. But as I say, some people lost their shirt, and I think it's the Americans and Europeans who are using Cyprus as a tax haven. Uh, the mafia and uh, Russian oligarchs were using it as a tax haven as well. There's a great deal of corruption going on Russia uh, in Russia, and a lot of that money has exited the country and has been stuffed in uh, in various international tax haven banks. The Caribbean is full of uh, money from Europe and Russia, as well as Cyprus is their favorite one, just because there's this contention there between Greece and, and Turkey over the control of Cyprus. And uh, so the Russians have been able to intervene and use some muscle there to make sure that they get their way. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh now, what does that mean, though, for general depositors? Do you think that there'll be some flight of, of uh, institutional capital or large depositors in Europe? Or do you think, because I see the uh, euro has dropped versus the dollar the lowest in four months. Is there some uh, of that effect happening? Yes, yes, there is. One of the major fallout from this is the fact that there have been for decades Americans who have been putting their money in tax havens overseas. Uh, Enron, for example, had 800 overseas bank accounts. Now those people are running very scared because they see that they're the ones that are going to get stuck. Their accounts can be seized at any time. There is no more guarantee about privacy, no more guarantee about sanctity of accounts, private accounts. This has really changed the game in terms of people seeking to avoid U.S. taxes or U.S. confiscation by going overseas. That money is coming home. Because, first of all, the Fed has the most power to keep bailing out banks so there won't be a banking uh, collapse. And secondly, um, that because of the, the power of the people in this country to really protest things and how antagonistic they're getting towards bank bailouts, it's going to be very difficult to seize accounts here in the United States. But what I do see coming is a seizure of private pension accounts, not seizure, but putting them in or transferring them in a mandatory way to government pension accounts in order yeah. to uh, save the budget. So in other words, what you're saying is they're trying to find a way to obtain liquid capital, uh, and uh, they've obviously been stung by this, which means it's very unlikely to actually have a bank run or need to pull your money. But the biggest place in capital is pension funds. I've heard a number as high as $6 trillion just in America. So the government will want to get their paws on that and give us, give us an IOU is what you're saying. Yes, but it will take another crisis down the road, I expect, no earlier than, two, than three or four years from now. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's lots of time left, too. Back in a moment with Joel Skousen and a deep analysis of what's really going on. Joel, you're uh, 
newsletter every week is quite, quite remarkable, and of course you clarify with lots of documentation, lots of good quotes too that stick in people's minds, like the quote from Dr. Stan Montes in your last newsletter, building the best enemy money can buy. And remember that quote from Dr. Stan, I think it was very, it sticks in your mind like a, like a Velcro. And, uh, you know, it's something we both agree with, that uh, the U.S. Uh, shouldn't think that China and Russia are our friends. They're not. Their ultimate goal is they want a, a new world order where they're on the top of the heap. And uh, they're using, our government has been complicit with the spying agencies and the transfer of technology and the invasion of our, you know, the best, you know, technology that that can be stolen is shipped to China, and they're they're being pretty aggressive about it. Their latest, for example, military operations were like 1,200 miles from their coast in an area that's disputed with the Philippines. Um, they're flexing their muscle, not just in that way, but in doing unbelievably unethical activities. But they're totally collaborating with our government. Our government is helping these characters, facilitating Chinese spying. Uh, on American soil, and then of course we have the the Russians doing what we call bomber uh, type of uh, di- diplomacy, where they bring the bombers close to the uh, areas of the, of the American coast or uh, Guam and other areas where they're they're basically trying to threaten us that they have their nuclear bombers near our uh, territories. So, well, can you expand on well, some of these things because the they're running strategic. Uh, practice runs at the United States to get further and further into the Pacific. Guam, next we'll start to see overflights over Hawaii. They always have done overflights over Alaska and Canada, and even over the United States itself at times. But we haven't seen this degree of, um, you know, nuclear posturing and testing for about six years. So they're definitely on the upswing now. Of course, China is is very worrisome because the, our government, even though it's illegal to do so, uh, China's on the banned list for any military technology. And yet the Commerce Department continues to allow companies and, and grant them export licenses for things that have military uh, effects. Uh, and this started in the Bush administration, so this is not just Barack Obama. Uh, this is a globalist agenda that both their public presidents, Republican or Democrat, follow. Uh, NASA has employed, um, you know, some 30 Chinese scientists at their Langley Research Center, which is just unconscionable. We still do exchanges with China and Russia in our weapons laboratories. I mean, what's the purpose of that? You know, doesn't make any ago, sense at all. I was covering in the World Affairs Brief how Lockheed Martin and Hughes uh, Aerospace had Chinese military officers uh, coming into their factories. The, the workers there protested so highly, they shut the workers out on Saturdays and let the Chinese have the run of the place on Saturday when the workers weren't there to protest or witness. Well, in, in, in the mid-90s, I took care of employees working at the Lockheed Martin facility in Littleton where they built the RD-80, a Russian rocket, and they had Russian technicians and scientists there and in all of these companies, they had former CIS nations, technicians and scientists. Many of them were former nuclear scientists or engineers working in the military industry in Russia within just a couple of years of Glasnost to Perestroika working in Colorado on these highly technical things that have military applications. And uh, General Dynamics and other places in Needles, California and elsewhere, they literally shut the doors to their own scientists and let them walk in with zip drives, photographs, everything, taking whatever they wanted. Uh, from the facility was just obscene in the extreme and uh, I think that this is a suicidal move on the part of our government and across as you say administrations it's not just Democrats it's both sides of the aisle are doing this and of course the long-term strategic goal is that they want to help Russia and China gain the confidence to strike the West they're 10 years behind their schedule they wanted this strike back in the 90s, and it never came because of the, uh, uh, you know, first of all, there was the phony fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union helped the group. Uh, the U.S. intelligence knew that it was phony. They knew that it was uh, bogus, that the KGB couldn't capture Gorbachev in his undefended villa. I mean, they've overthrown hundreds of governments around the world, and they can't capture Gorbachev in an undefended villa. And then the so-called Politburo flees, the head of the GRU, the military intelligence, the defense minister, and the head of the KGB flee for their lives. And I ask the question, well, who are they fleeing from? They're the heads of the 
security apparatus and say, who are they fleeing from? They must, in fact, they're puppets and were not, in fact, the real leaders, and that's what happened. They put puppets into those positions so they could pretend to overthrow them and have a free market emerge in, in Russia, but it was all a phony thing. And so this week, yeah. one of the major oligarchs of Russia, Boris Berezovsky, was assassinated. They claim he committed suicide, but the British investigators admitted that the only sign of death they can find is consistent with hanging. Now, Ooh. you can't hang yourself and then end up in a bathtub if you are, you know, going to commit suicide. You commit suicide on the end of the rope, you stay on that end of the rope until someone discovers you. There was a scarf nearby in his body, and I hypothesized that someone strangled him with the scarf while he was down on the floor or in the bathtub. But that brings up the question, because, you see, Boris Berezovsky has been the chief oligarch. He was the chief communist leader behind Gorbachev. Gorbachev was a mid-level arms control negotiator two years before he ascended to the premiership in Russia which means that somebody selected him. You don't get that far ahead in Russia under normal Stalinistic politics without killing people. He was put into place by people behind the scenes. I think Boris Berezovsky was the chief communist leader of Russia during that period because he emerged as the general secretary of the Commonwealth of Independent States, the follow-on organization of the Soviet Union after the phony fall contact on the Russia list leaked out something that said a Kremlin source saw Berezovsky and Yeltsin and several other high-level officials go into a room and Yeltsin stepped aside and let Berezovsky walk in first. And Russian protocol, that means that Berezovsky was higher than Yeltsin. Yeltsin, right. as we all know, was a drunkard and a puppet. He was not running the show. And the oligarchs got, the, the former communist leaders got wealthy by instructing the state bank of Russia to loan them the money to buy shares in all of these major industries. And so that's well, how Berezovsky got in charge of many of the industrial powerhouses. Guzinski got the media. Uh, uh, Gorbachev made a deal with a young buck in those days named Roman Abramovich. And they, he gave him the money, in essence, or facilitated him giving the money so that he would have 50% of SIFTNET, the big oil company that Berezovsky was behind. Then when Berezovsky fled the country about a uh, decade and a half ago, just before Putin came to power, uh, there was this ruse politically in Russia that the oligarchs were cast out of the country, that they were the enemy of the, of the people and that Putin was the champion of the people against the oligarchs. The trouble is with that theory, Spanish intelligence revealed that Putin met with Boris Berezovsky five times in his villa in Spain the year that he ascended to the president. Ah, let's continue with this story when we come back. to touch on is uh, what's happening in terms of the uh, chemical weapons, the issues in Syria, the regime change is still being pushed, and the overflights now being protested by Kerry and Obama from Iran to Syria, bringing troops and, and weapons probably, them trying to demand that all the flights stop and get checked in Syria to make sure they're not overflying with material for the Syrian government to, to continue in power. Um, that's part of it. Then, of course, the the uh, use of chemical weapons, which we know that the rebels claim to have chemical weapons, uh, this situation I don't think is resolving to the agreeable resolution of the Europeans or NATO or the global bankers. Obviously, there's an agenda here that's hard to understand why they think they're going to continue doing regime change when I don't see it happening. Well, no, it's going to happen without the fail. Assad's going to be taken down. He's just preserved. Uh, uh, well, it's going to take a while. So if it's going to happen, it'll take some a because number more months. Attack, they cannot attack Iran. Israel can't attack Iran as long as Assad is there at his back door. 
with missiles, and hundreds of missiles that they can throw at Israel. And that's the reason why Syria and Assad are being targeted. It's just a matter of time. They're, they're trying to use this chemical weapons as the reason for intervention. The U.S. is preparing to intervene. Um, but Assad has proved uh, that he has outmaneuvered them. Uh, he correctly said that the uh, opposition, in fact, had got a hold of some of the chemical weapons. The U.S. has trained them on how to shoot off a rocket and blame it on Syria. And so instead of letting the U.S. run to, run, run to the U.N. For, for permission to attack, Syria runs to the U.N. and says investigate. And that basically keeps the U.S. from attacking until that investigation is over, and they're going to find out that it wasn't Syria. Right. Uh, so... I think they're just, uh, it's still going to take longer, but uh, Syria will go down. They won't take no for an answer, you can tell. Uh, now, if that happens, though, the next step is there's going to be a broader war, because it's not just going to be a few bombing runs of Iran and it's over. It's a country of 80 million people. It's around the border of Russia. Uh, you have to deal with the northern Iraqi uh, army now that's pretty well supplied because they have money because of the oil there. Uh, this is a Shiite-Shia war that's going to get much broader, and regionally that means probably the regular routes that bring oil out of the Strait of Hormuz are going to be shut off. I can't see how normal oil transfer, even the insurance companies will just say, this is a war zone, we can't let oil move sort of tankers through where they can get hit with missiles or bombs or torpedoes. Um, you know, if that's going to happen, it obviously means sometime in the next say, year, you're going to have the closure of the Strait of Hormuz if Syria does fall, is what I'm saying. Well, I don't think it's going to be a gradual escalation. I think it's going to be target Syria only until she's down, and then Israel will target Iran, and that will then turn into a regional war. Yeah, that exactly. Will affect the affect the of four moves. So, in other words, anyway, uh, that process could take a couple of years for it to devolve into that kind of level of tyranny. Uh, I don't think it'll take a couple of years, Bill. I think as soon as Syria is down, within a few months, they'll take on Iran. Yeah, so we're looking at a much narrower window, maybe less than a year. I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so now the other thing is baiting of the bullets. I, I didn't. Stop. I didn't get to finish, Phil. What we were oh, talking yes. about in Russia and Berezovsky. Ah, oh, yes. Let's continue with that. Yeah. So uh, Berezovsky was, in fact, the oligarch controlling Putin. Putin was his puppet, but somewhere between. Putin and then and now, I think there was a coup among the other senior oligarchs uh, against Berezovsky. And a lot of that is because, you know, when Berezovsky went overseas, hiding out in, in or living up the high life in England, you can't very well run a secret operation in Moscow without being there. And so I think the other senior oligarchs, uh, like, you know, who, who stayed in Moscow, essentially said, we don't need Berezovsky anymore, and they cut him out. Uh, part right. of cutting him out was eliminating his money supply. That was, the, uh, they, they got to him through uh, Ramon, or Roman Abramovich, who was his partner in Sifnet Oil. And, of course, now Abramovich has, has run the entire company, Berezovsky, lost his core battle owed some $2 billion to Abramovich and was very, very depressed about it. Remember, too, that um, Alexander Litvinenko, uh, the spy, the former KGB and FSB spy who uh, was on Berezovsky's side and made some very public statements against Putin, exposed the fact that Putin was using false flag terror events to justify the Chechen war, he got killed through radiological poisoning. So uh, it really looked like there's been a coup against Berezovsky, and he has been killed and eliminated. Now, what is also interesting, that there's another protege of Berezovsky that's still alive and well, though he's in prison, and that's Mikhail uh, Khodorkovsky, who was the oil baron in turn, uh, the young oligarch in charge of Yukos Oil. Just prior to being put in prison for corruption and tax evasion, he gifted all of his shares in Yukos Oil to none other than Jacob Rothschild. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Wow. So what is interesting about this 
is that uh, Horokowski is a pro-communist reformer, meaning he wants the Communist Party to come back and take charge of Russia. He's been saying he's in prison. This is very suspicious because, you know, in prison, he's had a tremendous amount of ability to communicate with the world. They allow him to do that. I don't think he's in any high-security prison at all. I think this may well be a plant. You know, the Russians often do things like, if Putin becomes sufficiently unpopular, we have to prepare someone in the opposition to take over Putin, who, in fact, will bring us back to the former Soviet Union. That person may be Kodorkowski because he's got a folk following in Russia now. The Russian authorities and the Putin have just pulled every illegal string to keep him in prison. So he's kind of like the underdog that everyone's rooting for to come out of prison. Ah. Uh, so maybe this so, is a bit of a manipulation of the public uh, uh, attitude so that they can have a kind of a new leader to bring it back to the former Soviet Union and yeah, reemerge as a new have Soviet a Union. They one two man so that they can, if one goes down, they have another one to take the place who appears to be in opposition, but he's not in opposition. Now, the interesting thing that I haven't figured out yet, though, is this connection with Jacob Rothschild. Now, Jacob Rothschild had a falling out with the major Rothschild bank, or the appearance of a falling out, run by Robert Rothschild, the, the formal Rothschild banking empire. But Jacob Rothschild has, in fact, become extremely wealthy through his Rothschild uh, uh, internal trust that he runs. And I, I'm, I'm convinced it's got to be still part of the Rothschild empire. But whether or not this is the globalist trying to influence an up-and-coming Russian leader who's currently in prison, uh, offering to keep his money safe while he's in prison, or whether or not Kordokowski is, is, in fact, you know, working for the communists still and simply using the globalist, I don't know at this point. It will become obvious sometime in the future whether or not he's really... Uh, being persecuted by the communists, or whether or not the communists are using him as a phony opposition. But now we know that, that the, the we know the Rothschilds, in a sense, have set up the currency of Europe. The euro is a Rothschild currency, and I'm wondering if some of this thing with the play with Cyprus and so on ties in with the Russian attempt to want to get in control of the gas fields around Cyprus and have a port at Cyprus. Is there some kind of a jockeying for position here with Russia and China and the Europeans? with the current financial situation. So Russia well, I spec- is... I speculated yeah. in the World Affairs Brief, Bill, that um, one of the reasons why the negotiations with Russia, between Russia and Cyprus, failed over this additional loans or the softening of the terms of the loan, I postulated it may have been because Russia wanted a foothold in the, ga- in the interest of gas. I mean, that's the only thing in the future that Cyprus has as collateral. Now that yeah. they're banking, the banking sector, frankly, is gone. There's nobody, right. nobody going to trust them. Exactly. In other words, their banking industry is now become No one will hide their money there anymore. This is kind of remarkable, some of the uh, issues we're talking about today. The uh, uh, number of other ones that are going on lately, too. This situation of the domestic spying. We talked about, in your article, you talked about Blackwater security. Was Blackwater CIA? (laughs) Uh, And, of course, recently we had the Rand Paul uh, uh, endorsing a pathway to citizenship for illegals. His recent uh, filibuster uh, dealing with the issues of the Second Amendment. Let's touch on some of these issues in this last segment, whichever you'd like to, uh, Joel, because there's a number of issues that I think are preparing for the 2014 senatorial races. We have Obama on a jihad to prevent the Glass-Steagall bill from coming in and into legislation, which it looks like there's a big push to get it back up again, the Glass-Steagall bill. Uh, where's all of this going? Well, you know, we always find out after the fact things that Blackwater had a seamless relationship with the CIA. But what that really meant was that Blackwater was part of the dark side of government. It wasn't yeah. a seamless relationship with the white side of the CIA. It was a seamless relationship with the dark side of the CIA, which is the dark side of American government. 
Right. It, I have a posted. Uh, so, technically speaking, of course, Blackwater was a CIA, but they had the kind of immunity that CIA operations had, and that's what we have found out. Even when they had these errors, they were covered for, and uh, that's why they changed their name to a few times to kind of whitewash their their background. But yeah, I that's why they changed it to Academy purpose. eventually. They went to Z and then they became Academy. <laughs> yeah, well, in any case, I think the real purpose of hiring these mercenary companies is to build a cadre and vet that cadre of former military people who are unprincipled enough to take down American patriots. I have never believed that they need to bring in thousands of foreign troops. They have plenty of unprincipled people, just like the Nazis had plenty of brown shirts to go door to door and arrest people, just like the Soviets. They didn't have to bring in foreign troops. You you just use the unprincipled people you train up as mercenaries. In fact, you know, half of our police forces are very thuggish and wouldn't, wouldn't bat an eye about following orders to go ahead and arrest people over weapons violations. Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, it would only take a period of maybe three to six months of door-to-doors with the current Blackwater and these other people that could be easily recruited uh, to do this, even if it's in violation. And, you know, we have a number of Marines and other military that wouldn't do it, but, you know, does it, would, it stop, would, it, would it stop what happened in the Second World War? I don't think we're qualitatively different than what happened in Nazi Germany. Well, except that we're much better armed than the German people are. And uh, so a lot of people are going door-to-door arresting people for guns but get shot and killed. Right, and I think it would put a stop to it pretty... It might put a stop in some jurisdictions, but not everyone. Uh, In some jurisdictions, especially in places like rural Texas, Oklahoma, uh, lots of places I think it would put a stop to the attempts to try to seize guns. But in other areas in big cities like New York City, I don't think it would be as easy to be able to prevent these seizures from happening. And there isn't any real danger of that until the government gets a pretty comprehensive list. And that's why I think they were very disappointed they weren't able to get the assault weapons ban in the Senate bill, because it's the grandfather, the phony grandfathering clause that they intended to introduce, meaning that the rest of you who have assault weapons, you can keep them as long as you tell us where they are. Yeah, and right. I'll say anybody who tells the government where they are, of course it's a felony if you don't tell them. And they find you have a weapon, so you can't use it anymore. You can't go out and practice unless you tell the government. It's a real slippery slope, but they really wanted yeah. that bad, and they didn't get it. Well, um, the background uh, check bill, though, is the thing that I think is the edge of the wedge, as they say, because it means if you pass a, a gun to your son if you're hunting and you don't do a background check, you're involved with a federal crime. Uh, this is the next step, I think, in, in their way of nibbling away or chomping away at the Second Amendment is the background check uh, approach toward, uh, you know, cutting off the Second Amendment rights. Right, but that only gets a certain portion of weapons that transfer hands. That still doesn't get them where they want to go. They need a grandfathering clause that requires registration to be legal. And you see, technically, that doesn't appear they can sell that as not a violation of the Second Amendment because we're not taking away any guns. We're just requiring registration which the Second Amendment doesn't say anything about. And it should be resisted. As we know, Canada pulled the same ploy. We just want you to register, and now they're they're calling them in. So it is inevitable. The government is lying about this. And we'll have one or two or three more Sandy Hooks until they finally get what they want. But uh, if Americans are smart, they won't uh, participate. Now, you know, bypassing the the registration requirement of the background checks is really relatively easy. All you've got to do is uh, falsify a, uh, a transfer before the current date, and there's no way that they can tell that that transfer occurred after the date. So it's not hard to evade these new requirements. Uh-huh. What are the other emerging stories that you're following in your newsletter that will be coming up this Friday? Well, the main stories are about the, the Russians uh, being given, a, uh, being able to get their funds out of Cyprus, and the uh, the story that we covered already on Boris Berezovsky, the coup against him. Uh, what I haven't found out, and I put out some um, feeders to my sources in Russia to see if they can figure out 
who are the other oligarchs behind the scenes who, in fact, have, uh, have killed Berezovsky. And uh, this is a real tough thing. Nobody knows for sure right now. Are these new other oligarchs, do you think, allied or in contradiction to Putin? Because it... No, no, no. Um, Putin is working for them. He's working yeah. for whoever still runs the Communist Party. Uh, Moscow insiders still say you hear this all the time in the Kremlin. The party says this, the party says that. That's a holdover from Soviet days. They mean the Communist Party, and it's still alive. It's still well. Yeah. Uh, we're yeah. not referring to the above-ground Communist Party, which holds about a 20% minority in Russian politics. That's just the above-ground facade of the Communist Party so that people can believe that it's still around. The real Communist Party is still underground, still running the show in there. And yeah. as you and I discussed, there's very few people who acknowledge that the fall of the Soviet Union was a carefully crafted deception. But it yeah, was, and it still is. Even uh, Gorbachev made statements in, in that publicly, but people don't want to quote him. Um, how far are we away from some of the kind of the main events that are likely to trigger an economic meltdown, a regional war in the Middle East is less than a year away. That kind of event could trigger a worldwide depression if the oil stops in the Middle East. Um, well, no, we, I really don't think it would. Uh, one of the reasons why the U.S. is finally allowing U.S. oil to come on the market and uh, is because during a future war, they know that we'll be cut off, even the Middle East oil that we've gotten through occupation. And so... You know, it was taboo to use American oil for so many years, but now it's coming online, and I think it's still... The, uh, there is no cataclysmic event, I think, that, would, that gives us an economic meltdown, um, unless the powers that be simply want to pull the plug. Uh, Do you think they want, to kind of, they want to implode it at a specific point while they can maintain control, rather than wait for two or three or four years for things to have an, no, an, an event think, that they can't control? they want to... I think they want to wait till war so they've got cover on this. If they pull the plug and everything implodes, they're going to get the blame, and people are going to be hopping mad. They're going to have a tough time, you know, thwarting a true conservative wanting to come in and, and remedy things. But if they, if they keep this thing muddling along, they keep mild inflationary pressures so that we have a mild inflationary recovery, and keep it going until war comes, and they walk away scot-free. They don't get the blame for any of this. And then they and get is, find, I mean, finally have a new, a new world order that justifies having a world currency replacing the dollar. You cannot get to a world currency without a world government that right. has the power to control that currency and how well, much we, inflation we, it's about. We, we, I see the Cyprus thing as part of this jockeying for position in this new world order that's emerging. Uh, I see the uh, transfer of information technology to China and Russia as part of the, the scheme. And uh, we're probably a matter of years away before this devolves. But there's some uncontrolled elements that I'm sure that, that freak out the globalists as well because they're not in absolute control. And they're certainly not all of one mind, are they? That's right. There are factions, as we found out, in Russia and in Cyprus. Yeah, amazing. That's why Berezovsky went down. Amazing intrigue. Thank you, Joel, for discerning and researching all these amazing topics. We need to have you back on more regularly. Hope you're feeling well now after, after that remarkable miracle of surviving that crash. Back tomorrow with uh, a major update. Ben Barrick's book with Walid Shubat, The Case for Islamophobia, hour number one, hour three. Tim Alexander, historian, and Chris Harrison, nuclear expert from the NRC. Back tomorrow. Stay tuned regularly to the Department Report. We thank you for your support. Thank you.